Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Tracy Tebahama Espinosa. I'm speaking to you from here in Quito, Ecuador. Welcome to week seven, uh, language. This week we're going to be focusing on a lot of different topics or sub-areas of language. First we're going to quickly review the goals of this particular unit and then talk about the origins and the evolution of human language. Then we're going to consider some of the different variations in human language as well as the development of language in children. And in part two, we're going to actually have a good look at uh, bilingualism and multilingualism, which is a particularly favorite topic of mine. Uh, just as a quick reminder, the resources for this course, the extra readings, as well as the backup um, PowerPoints can be found within the uh, course room. To start, what were the goals, or what are the goals of this unit? Basically, we have um, four key goals. Um, one uh, previous goal, one is to understand basically where did human language come from in an evolutionary sense, and then to understand how does a person's first language actually develop, where does that come from. Then we're going to look at clarifying the concepts of critical uh, versus sensitive periods in language development, and then on to identifying characteristics of specific language impairments, what problems can occur. And then from there, part four, which would be uh, the second video we're going to look at, will be to explain the important features of bilingualism and multilingualism by sort of uh, taking apart the myths of multilingualism and considering uh, key factors that do influence um, successful language learning. Um, to do this, we'd want to look at some guiding questions. Hopefully this will help sort of focus in on the types of um, the key elements or key concepts that we want to look at in this particular unit. Uh, first, um, we want to ask ourselves, is learning language natural? Is it actually natural? Is it something that the brain can't help uh, but do? And if uh, that's so, what, what are the minimum requirements needed to actually stimulate language development? Um, we also want to have a look at whether or not, um, what is the context of the world uh, right now? Is most of the world actually monolingual? Um, when would it be recommended to learn a foreign language? And for those of you who are already bilingual or multilingual, um, what have been the key factors that have actually influenced your own language learning? So basically, to begin, we'd like to actually have a look at what is the purpose? What is the purpose of language? Uh, many people, uh, if you ask yourself this question, might, now you might have a first think that it's actually just to communicate. Um, we're going to look a little bit deeper into the idea that maybe language actually facilitates the way um, we can actually work together, that we can actually... Uh, create as societies or as um, as a species. So I'd like to take a take a little bit of an extension on this idea of just general communication and make it go a little bit further, hopefully. To define this, um, Chomsky and colleagues, they like to uh, put language into the context of actually being a culturally specific uh, system. It's basically set up with, um, with a bunch of rules that are agreed upon by a certain society, a group of people, in a cultural context. So there's a very, very strong link between culture and language. Uh, and later on, we're also going to talk about um, thought and how might thought be bound by the languages that you might know. And we're also going to have a little look at, um, at this concept of inner language or inner speech, um, something that we saw in week three related to uh, Vygotsky's concept of where, um, how we use words uh, to actually come up with the thinking or the, the limits of our, our, our cognition. Um, so let's start off with looking at the origins of human language. We know um, that there's a general debate about whether or not other species, other animals actually have language. Um, but let's sort of break it down and hopefully, um, if I can try to convince you that all animals can communicate. Uh, we know that that's true. But humans are actually the only animal that actually has uh, language. Um, we can see this, you know, as far as, you know, chasing Dr. Doodle or actually trying to think, well, can we talk to the animals? I'm sure we can communicate with them, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are actually speaking back to us. Um, to illustrate some of the key aspects of language that distinguish humans from other animals, we're going to have a quick look at a video. Um, it's about seven minutes long. I hope you'll bear with me. Thanks. As Dr. Hurst was um, showing us, basically all, and Dr. Marcus as well, um, we're showing a lot of how uh, an other animals might be able to communicate, but they basically don't have language in the way that we do, is way, the way humans do. And the second huge point is that the brain is basically wired to be able to um, conduct sophisticated uh, thought through language and using a whole, uh, a great variety of different mechanisms within the brain.
Uh, we know that this has absolutely nothing to do uh, necessarily with size. Size isn't everything. So you have elephants with huge brains, but they can't really speak. This has something to do with um, something beyond uh, brain anatomy um, that actually helps us or helps human beings uh, be able to speak in the way they do. There's this concept of um, human beings as a third uh, chimpanzee or the third ape, basically. Um, we know that after we branched off from orangutans and there was this general connection with um, bonobos, gorillas, and chimpanzees, um, we're very, very similar to them, but they still can't speak. Well, we can speak. We have a different, a much more sophisticated way of communicating. Uh, even though we can transmit communicative uh, signals through uh, visual expression, it's not the same as actually using words. And if you look at how the mechanism um, functions within vocal communication, it's pretty much the same um, in other primates. But um, you'll find differences in, um, in a very distinct way. It's something much more um, physical um, related to um, the larynx. We actually know that the way um, the human mouth actually got shorter um, and actually the larynx got actually longer. And so because of this, the way that sounds are processed in the brain actually uses a, a greater, uh, a lot more um, real estate in the brain to actually pronounce things or to talk. We also know that because of the way that the, the voice box developed in human beings, Humans, here's uh, Jane Goodall, who can actually, she can speak like the ape, but the ape can't speak like she can because she has the benefit of a specialized voice box. So we know because of this prolonged um, um, pharynx here, and then because of the voice box, we are able to speak um, and to use and to have a greater variety of sounds than other, um, other primates. Um, I'd like to highly recommend that you watch the BBC video that's uh, mentioned on this particular slide. Uh, it's a little bit long for our video right now, so I'm going to skip it, but I hope that you do take the time to come back to it. We also know that it has, uh, going back to the point about it not being necessarily related to um, brain space or size, we know that, for example, Neanderthal men had a bigger brain than, than um, a modern man has, so we know it doesn't have to do necessarily with the, the mass of the brain, but rather the connections that are occurring within the brain. But something even more um, interesting and maybe calls our attention to how is it that we were able to develop language and other primates weren't uh, might have to do more with a genetic makeup. We know that um, other primates um, have 48 chromosomes. We have just 46. Now you'd say, well, how can having less be more? Um, there is a concept of basically a, a fusioning. So there could have been a point where we had um, where we came from, the apes, we actually, actually at some point there was a fusion of two different chromosomes into one, and that could have potentiated um, what we know to be language. We have identified, we believe that there's a gene for uh, human language, or at least we recognize that in the absence of this gene, um, there is no language. So we know that um, when there isn't the presence of, of FOXP2, we, we don't have language. So we presume that because of that gene, we are able to speak. Okay, so now we're going to turn um, from basically the origins of why we have human language in the first place to the variation in human language. Um, there's roughly 2,500 to 6,000 languages out there in the world. There's about 2,500 pure languages. And then when you count um, pidgin, creoles, dialects, then it bumps up to more, uh, a bit over 6,000 different um, varieties. Um, they're divided into families, so you can see that, for example, in this coded, color-coded bar, there's Celtic languages, there's Italic languages, um, there's different languages that are Germanic-based, so these are only European languages, for example, on this particular chart, but we know that um, there's something to the history of languages. They can grow up together, say, for example, uh, Latin-based languages, so uh, Italian, Spanish, French. If you grow up with, uh, or, or these languages historically grew up together, so they have uh, very, very similar uh, grammatical structures, they share um, verb bases, so basically we know that people who uh, know one of these languages, sometimes they're mutually intelligible. For example, if you know Spanish, you can listen to Italian, you can pretty much catch almost everything. Same thing with Portuguese. Um, we also know there's a second way that languages um, are related, and that has to do with um, a linguistic categorization or um, typologies, which we'll look at in just a second. But just to illustrate, um, basically around the world, there uh, of these 2,500 languages, or these 6,000 different um, languages and dialects and pidgins and creoles, 
um, we see that there's a, a dominance. It doesn't have to do with um, basically where they are in the world, because we know, for example, that Mandarin is um, the most highly spoken first language, but uh, it's only spoken in China, basically. So we realize that it's not a geographical necessary um, limitation. It's the more land you have, the, the more people speak the language, not at all. Um, it has more to do with actually um, popular use. It has to do with economics, commerce, and a lot of other things, social media. Um, but we'll look at that in just a second. Um, some examples for exa uh, of families of languages uh, would be within the European range. So for example, in within the Latin-based languages, you have French, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian. Within the Dutch or the Germanic languages, you have uh, German, English, Dutch, Danish, Swedish. So there's certain languages that are um, connected to each other through historical roots. Um, there's some other examples from all around the world. There's just different, uh, different groupings that we have. And then we have a second type of grouping that are types of families of languages that have to do with linguistic typology. All languages have verbjects, subjects, objects. And if you have three things, you can basically combine them in six different ways, right? But for some reason, all human languages or most human languages fall into only three types. Um, verb, subject, object languages, subject, verb, object languages, and subject, object, verb languages. Um, English is a subject, verb, object uh, language, so the order of the uh, the different types of words are used or are put into that grammatical structure. And basically we know that if languages share typologies, they're also easier to learn. So um, people don't uh, have this great confusion when they're actually trying to learn another language if they have a, if they're learning a language that shares the linguistic typology. Um, just kind of a curiosity of the languages spoken around the world. We know that um, basically as native language speakers, uh, Mandarin um, beats out all of them, Spanish, then English. But as far as second language learners, more people speak English than any other language in the world. And this is probably, it's, gonna, it's projected to last at least for another 40, 50 years. So um, yes, um, Chinese Mandarin is, is on the run, but it's actually not going to replace um, English for, for quite a while. Okay, so now let's turn to the development of language in human beings. Um, and be careful, all the information that we're sharing right now has to do with, you know, a typical or an average brain, which, you know, that's very hard to, to actually qualify. But um, this means that there's some outliers there. There's some people with, you know, extremely um, higher levels of intelligence. There are people with some learning disabilities. So basically what we're talking about right now would be an average. Um, and um, so if we want, we'll talk a little bit about um, language problems at the end of this particular presentation. So given an average brain, we know that about 90-95% of right-handed people and 70% of left-handed people have Broca and Wernicke's area in the left uh, frontal and parietal cortex. So basically, um, there's a lot of talk about the left hemisphere dominance for language, and that, that is true. I mean, the majority of people in the world do have um, these key language areas in the left hemisphere. However, 5 to 10 percent of right-handed people and 30 percent of left-handed people don't. So when we talk about, um, we sh can't really just say, yeah, language is a left hemisphere um, um, activity. We know that's def definitely not true. And we'll look at some examples of those exceptions at the end. Um, basically now, um, babies you know, who just uh, who are born premature babies, we can actually even scan and, and estimate how they've already they already perceive phonemes um, and they can hear different voices. So we know that language perception happens probably around the fifth month of gestation, um, as hearing actually kicks in in the womb. Um, and we need to clarify here something about critical versus sensitive periods for for language. We, here's a question for you, um, true or false? Are there critical, there are critical periods for first language? Are there critical periods for second language? And if there are or there aren't, um, does this apply to all the aspects of language? For example, understanding language, being able to speak and reading and writing. Um, are there critical periods for any of those elements? And basically, yes and no, okay? So there's no such thing as a critical period for a second language, or a third language, or a fourth language. Um, just as there's no critical period for any other academic subject, um, there are sensitive periods for that. And we know that the order in which skills are learned is far more important than the age of the individual. However, we do know that um, we can presume that there is probably uh, a sensitive period for one's first language. We're not, 
really, really sure because there's so few um, studies out there. Deaf populations, stroke victim, victims, feral children, Romanian orphans, there's very few uh, of these incidences, thank goodness, um, but it doesn't give us, uh, you know, 100% proof to say that there is a critical period for uh, your first language. However, the evidence that's out there is rather strong. We know that then, so there's no critical period for learning something like math or for reading or for writing, but there may be a critical period for um, speaking your very first language. To illustrate that, um, I'd like to show you a quick video of of uh, a girl who was brought up by um, dogs and to see exactly, so you can get a sense of where her language abilities are after having spent almost 60 years um, only um, in the company of, of, of animals. Hang on just a sec. We presume that cases like this one um, indicate to us even if a child has had human language, this child for example had language for three years, then she was isolated for almost six and then was reintegrated into society. So it's fascinating to see that with that early exposure, she was able to learn basic language. We, there are other feral ch uh, children cases where they actually find that um, if they were banded from birth, they didn't have these initial years of early contact, they never managed to um, uh, come up with language, even if they're only away or separated for short amounts of time. But apparently there is a key moment or key moments in these early years where there needs to be uh, early language exposure. Um, sensitive periods uh, are now basically replacing almost all aspects of uh, what we consider is uh, human development except for probably what would be this first language and some gross motor skills. We also know that learning occurs throughout the lifespan, um, that we can. If you haven't learned to read when you're um, you know, seven, you could do it when you're 17 or 27 or even cases of people who are 70 who learn to read. So we know that you can and do learn across the lifespan. Okay, so let's look at some key um, learning uh, or language milestones um, for children. We know that there's first signs of communication, uh, and this is not language, or is it language, okay? First signs of communication are when a child will cry, uh, communicate to the parent their needs, they're hungry, they're wet, uh, they're tired, they're cranky. And then children begin to actually coo and to imitate others. And by six months of age, we know that babies can actually recognize the sounds in their native language as compared to other languages. There's a wonderful video, uh, a bit too long to watch. It's about an hour-long lecture. It's wonderful, though, if you have the time, which is recommended here on the slide. Um, given these main uh, milestones, when uh, a child will begin to speak around first words around, um, around a year old, by around nine months of age, a child will actually recognize their own name, um, but this quickly um, multiplies, and um, by the time a kid is around three, you'll have more than 500 words, and that's in spoken sense. There's a, a far greater number of words that a child will understand, but not actually use. Um, some of the milestones that are, are suggested over the first five years, and, and five years is kind of like this, uh, this kind of bookends that we offer here, because by the time a kid hits five years old, you can really have a great conversation. Most kids five years old know all parts of grammar in their native language or languages. Um, to actually illustrate that, um, let's look at a couple of the main key stages of language development, a little two-minute two video for you. Mentioned um, in that short video, sorry for all the clicks back and forth. Um, we hope that there's a, that a, the child has a, a few words um, by about the first birthday, one to three words. We see that this actually goes and begins to actually explode really quickly. Um, by the time the child is two, three years old, there's great communication happening, even if these are only in short sentences, uh, two, three words together. And what's fascinating. Um, Atkinson actually points out that there's some real, the explosion of language is actually phenomenal. Um, by the time a kid hits around three and a half years old, they have over a thousand words in their vocabulary. And by the time the kid is six years old, um, he'll be expressing, um, probably using, you know, four to 14,000 words. And that's a huge variety there, but um, this has a lot to do with language stimulation in the home as well as in um, early school contexts and other social contact the kids have. Um, but they actually understand um, almost twice or, or, or more than twice as many um, words as they actually use. Uh, this is actually uh, quite, quite impacting. And, and most kids actually use this 
uh, use far fewer words than they actually know because they can get away with it. Uh, kind of law of minimal effort kind of a thing. They don't need um, more words. They can communicate their needs, um, and that's enough. So they basically don't use that many. Um, kids who basically get through high school, this is a, um, a figure for um, British uh, kids, they'll have around 40,000 words. And then if they do university, if they go through university, they can have between 50 and 100,000 words. Um, and those are actually used words. Um, we know that there's almost uh, twice as, or there are twice as many, around 200,000 words actually used by an average um, college graduate. Okay. Um, we're going to look at how social context, school settings, um, actually does change the brain and what would be the stimulus that we'd ask uh, you as parents or also you as um, teachers who are working with small kids, what can you actually do to actually fortify uh, language in small children? For the cut in the video, so the earlier the better, especially for foreign language introduction, the earlier the better. Um, we know of studies of kids um, brought up in trilingual environments, four languages, five languages, just fine. So we'll talk about that in the second video um, to come. Um, basically, very important um, element to understand, especially when choosing books to read with kids. Um, we know that in the early years, um, the type of vocabulary that's developed um, with really younger kids, um, below two more or less, um, is heavily reliant on nouns. They spend a lot of time learning nouns. It's fascinating to see that basically with parents or adults, this actually switches and the emphasis goes to verbs um, equally balanced with nouns and pronouns. So there's a change in the type of language that's used um, across the lifespan and that uh, age-appropriate books are actually very important um, um, when parents are selecting or teachers are selecting the types of things to read with kids. Um, okay, so Shifting gears a little bit, let's look at how we, um, the concept of actually inner speech or inner language, uh, thinking about words to thinking in words. Do you really think in words or do you actually think um, um, in concepts or in blobs or images? Um, the concept of using inner speech as a way of um, developing consciousness is actually something that's um, been discussed for, for, well, for centuries, even um, uh, there's uh, talk of, of Plato or there's uh, writings of, um, related to Aristotle that actually make reference to that. Is the little voice in your head actually something that is um, equal to your conscious, how you talk to yourself about uh, different things? Um, this has been written about a lot um, by Gotsky, uh, probably uh, one of the better known people on this. Um, more recent work by Steven Pinker um, also shows um, the, the importance of um, of um, inner thought or inner um, language. Some of the other points, um, more recently there's been um, an attempt to try to understand whether or not um, meaning is understood before um, um, there's an understanding of the syntax, understanding of the structure, and then how word strings come together to produce speech. Or is that a whole loop that goes backwards and forwards? And we do know that as well, that, that there's speech and then there's word strings and that's understood by other people and the meaning is, is gleaned. So this is a, is a two-way um, street. We also know, um, going back again to Vygotsky, is that um, there's a belief that age-wise, that um, first there is a... Speech is used actually to make a link with others. And it's a social connector, right? So the mother goes blah, 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 and the baby goes blah, blah, blah. So there's a, a link there. And then um, apparently this, this dies down, and you don't see the kids um, talking so much out loud. Which is, What's very interesting is that um, Piaget actually thought that this was sort of a maturation. You know, the brain uh, gets connected enough. We don't need to say things out loud to basically understand ourselves. Whereas Vygotsky had this other vision is that basically you go from... Uh, there's an inner development of concepts and external speech to society and then actually this gets internalized and becomes actually more and more sophisticated uh, the older one gets and so um, Vygotsky and perhaps this is the benefit he had of, uh, of having Russian he actually made a big distinction between what is sense what is sense of the word and what is the meaning of the word and what he um, basically um, 
conceived is, is that we might be using the same words, but as we mature and as we see different uses for that same word, our, our general understanding, the sense of that word actually grows, and so we might make reference to the same single word, but it's not just that word that we mean when we're connecting things. So some people actually say, well, they they don't think in words, they think in concepts. Well, this is very much coherent with Vygotsky's idea, is that basically that sophistication of the understanding of that word has grown so much that, yes, you are using that word, but it's related to a lot of other um, concepts as you, as you grow older and you actually link that word to other meanings. Um, so basically, Vygotsky um, believed that there was an e egocentric speech. We start off um, internally, we become more aware of others, we begin to speak externally, and then we stop uh, speaking out loud every time we need to, when, when we're thinking, and we actually have this inner speech, which he believes uh, um, continues to develop throughout the lifespan. This means, basically, this idea of this um, concept, the sense versus meaning idea, is that not necessarily uh, are you actually thinking in a word, but you're thinking of all the meanings attached to the word. So many people might say, oh no, I don't think in words, I do think in concepts, but basically um, this is coherent with this idea that you actually are thinking in those words which have expanded to embrace a lot of other concepts. Um, in general, Vygotsky related to language, um, there's a lot of great things that we can take from, from his um, studies. We know that children construct their own knowledge, we know that the development can't be divorced from social context, as we saw in the case of uh, the poor girl who was brought up by dogs, if there is no social context, then there is no development of language or at least appropriate development. Um, prior concepts influence how we learn new concepts and that language plays a central role in mental development and this great belief that perhaps uh, the limits of your knowledge of what you can know is it might be um, constrained by the words that you have to actually express uh, what you know about your world. Um, we're going to have a look, a quick look, about five minutes of what Vygotsky thought of related to language, and then about three minutes of what um, Chomsky's uh, view is on language right now. Now we revisit speech and language development. We have covered the basic assumptions of Vygotsky's theory of cognitive development, and now I want to focus specifically on the principles of speech and language development. According to Vygotsky, Speech begins as a means of communication and socializing and later becomes a tool of thinking. His research led to the identification of four major stages of speech development. The first stage is pre-intellectual speech. This is the first major stage of speech development. This begins with the infant's cry, which expresses, for example, hunger or discomfort. Soon, the infant begins babbling, laughing, and gesturing. These developments function as a means of social contact. The next stage is called autonomous speech. At around 12 months of age, the child begins to invent words. The child's invented syllables are an effort to communicate with adults. These pseudo-words are useful because they indicate an object in plain sight, and they can also facilitate limited communication with adults who understand the meanings. For example, a child may initially say ba for bottle, and then as she develops, ba becomes the word bottle. Our third stage is called naive psychology. This stage of speech occurs between 18 and 24 months when the child first begins to use adult words. The child learns that objects are referred to by name. As the child begins to name things, connections develop between words and objects. During this period, the young child's first expression is a simple word. For example, when the young child says, Dada, it may mean, Daddy, pick me up, or Daddy, I'm hungry, and so on. As the child's thoughts become differentiated, she can formulate simple requests in the form of short and simple sentences. The final stage is communicative and egocentric speech. As indicated in the description of naive psychology, the child between 18 and 24 months begins to use adult words and rapidly expands his or her vocabulary. Subsequently, at about age 3, the child's speech splits into two types of speech, communicative and egocentric. Communicative, or also referred to as external speech, is for others 
and the child at age three is able to use simple sentences such as, I want milk. In contrast, egocentric speech is for oneself. From about the age of three to seven, there's a lengthy period of the development of egocentric speech. Egocentric speech often occurs in the presence of other children involved in the same activity, such as playing house together. It also occurs when the child is engaged in a practical tool-using activity. An example is a child attempting to get a cookie from the top of a cabinet. In these activities, the child's talk is a monologue. It is not intended to be a communicative form of speech. For example, our child wants to reach a cookie from the high cabinet. She may say to herself, I'm going to push this chair and climb up to get the cookie. She's not necessarily communicating with anyone. She is simply stating these directions for herself. This is also referred to as self-talk. Self-talk guides a child through a task. During the preschool period, egocentric speech becomes increasingly abbreviated. Vocalization eventually ends and egocentric speech moves inward as inner speech or communicative speech. This is defined as the process of talking to oneself mentally rather than out loud. It is a silent form of verbal thinking. However, it does not become fully functional until after age 12. The psychological nature of inner speech is important because it represents the most advanced level of the relationship between speech and thinking. So in some a quick three minute video on Noam Chomsky's view of, um, of language. Well, Chomsky and others believe that basically, um, well, language appeared relatively recently in, in uh, human history. Um, there's a huge distinction that they all agree upon, and that is that oral language, um, maybe there's a genetic disposition for speaking and all the rest of that, but when it comes down to reading and writing, these are less natural abilities. This is, there's nothing actually natural about this. And people like Stanislas de Hany and Marianne, Marianne Wolf. Uh, point out that this is actually something that is uh, really recent in human history and really not a natural thing for the brain to be able to do. Um, they, well, Stanislas Ehani himself came up with this concept of neuronal recycling. Basically, um, there are new cultural tools that we're faced with. For example, the ability to write is something that actually benefits um, human beings. So what could have happened? I mean, is it is it possible that there was this... Um, great um, evolution um, and, and being able to connect with written or symbol systems uh, very quickly. And he believes, well, that would be illogical to presume that. So a second theory might be that basically due to great, you know, the plasticity of the brain, the brain is uh, able to adapt really quickly to this. But since it's actually taken much longer, um, remember we mentioned in week three something related to like uh, the Baldwin effect. Basically it's something that's beneficial to a species that's repeated over time, then after many generations could actually be manifested in, in genes. And he places this idea into a concept called um, neuro, uh, neuronal recycling, in which parts of the brain that might have been used at some point, um, you know, like hundreds of thousands of years ago, millions of years ago, to actually, you know, scan the savanna for the enemy or for a, a tiger or a lion running at you, this is not necessarily needed um, in today's world for most people, so they basically, parts of the brain that might have been used to actually see that have actually been adapted now to uh, for the use of reading. So this is a fascinating concept because it might mean that um, since it's such a new function in the human brain, it could explain why there's so many uh, problems with, or with reading difficulties or with symbol systems in general, dyscalculia and all the rest of it. Um, for those of you who have time, I would really highly recommend that you watch this video of um, Sanasazi uh, intervention in, um, in a wonderful, um, quite quick speech that actually explains um, the brain and language, especially as it relates to uh, symbol systems and particularly uh, reading. Um, there are many uh, language circuits in the brain, um, as we saw in the very first one with Dr. Hirsch. Um, there are many overlapping uh, neural pathways that are used to complete language in the brain. There are different neural networks for viewing things um, that are different from listening to words, which are different from speaking, which are different from generating verbs, which are even more uh, far different from what would be um, reading and writing, which we'll see in just a minute.
Um, let's just look at some the very first four stages really quickly, a couple of really key examples of how uh, language development looks over the first few months of life so that we can actually, uh, as you watch this video, it's only about a minute long, but if you can think about the different things that are going on in that kid's head, it's just not one piece of the brain that's actually lighting up for language, but there's all of these very intricate networks which are developing um, during this stage. At first sight, these things look very normal, natural. These look like things that look seem very easy. However, if you think about the intricacies that are happening in the brain, uh, it's very, very complicated. Um, the way that these circuits are actually solidifying, the way that this network's are actually growing, um, very, very difficult um, if you rather actually look at actually what's going on inside the brain, not just um, the way it's manifesting in behavior. Um, so we know that there's different stages, we know there's different things that are going on, we know that there's different networks that are actually getting together to actually produce uh, language speech, and then moving on to a, a bigger stage, which would be reading and writing. Well, we know, and this also goes for multilingualism, um, it's quite easy to learn to speak. It takes between one and two years to actually learn to speak another language, but when it comes down to reading and writing, it's a very, very different uh, network. We now know because technology is actually advanced, we're able to actually see that it's not just... Um, we once believed that there were simple circuits that were happening. You could see a word, and then you would actually identify the symbol system, and then you would actually be hearing this, um, even if you're not saying anything out loud, you're, you've got a phonological loop going on in your head, we're actually hearing something, and then you're able to produce this and this comes out as, as speech. We now know because of uh, uh, imaging technology that it's a far more um, complicated task, the things that are going on in your brain as it reads uh, another language, and this again is Stanislav um, uh work. So the neural pathways for reading can actually be broken down into um, up to today, and I would say that this is probably going to change. Um, there are about uh, there are twelve neural pathways that are necessary for reading, plus four affective pathways um, that um, I was able to identify based on the work of all these other wonderful researchers. Um, first, we need to be able to have um, to be able to pay attention. The use of executive functions to pay attention to what is being read. Um, there is a need for a physical ability to actually see the word. Uh, the ability to generalize uh, conceptual understanding, which has to do with different symbol systems re which represent the same concept. For example, the different representations of three or the Roman numeral three or the Arabic three or three dots. Uh, the ability to mentally sound out words in one's mind, verbal coding. The ability to convert phonemes into words, so the k at into cat. The ability to search one's memory for the right word, um, so vocabulary recall. Um, the ability to understand the meaning of the word, so semantic understanding or semantic memory. The ability to correctly order the words, um, so this is a syntactic structural uh, design of the words so that they actually make sense to other people. The ability to associate context with appropriate prosody and intonation. So um, being able to say, if you say, you know, I'm pregnant, I'm pregnant, I'm pregnant, I'm pregnant, you know, same word, but the intonation actually changes the, the concept there. And number 10, the ability to unite all of those pieces and put it into a coherent sentence, either uh, written or spoken. The ability to unify sentences into a whole paragraph and then take those paragraphs and to create uh, what would be something uh, long written text. We also know that there's a big influence um, in the affective nature of learning anything. So the way the child feels about the learning process, if he's, meant, if he's made to feel badly about his attempts to read, um, we know that that has a huge influence and, and delays in, in learning to read. Um, how learning to read might impact his or her social status. So if they're prized for that or if they're given um, recognition at the lo local library or something like that, we know that that's very positive reinforcement to get kids to actually read more. We also know that there's a really huge ping pong relationship between uh, the teacher and the student. What the student perceives the teacher is feeling, what the teacher is now, you know, engaging uh, as, as they go along the teaching process. Well, what could I, how far can I actually push the student? What does the student really need from me to actually, you know, take on the, the, the learning? So we know that there's a huge um, influence on the way that the student and the teacher's relationship influences learning. And finally, motivational factors. Um, 
which also impact his ability uh, to read well. So if you're told um, these can be extrinsic motivating factors or internal intrinsic motivating factors, but we know that different kids will learn at different paces for different reasons and all very personalized. So we know that there's at least, and each of these uh, 16 different um, um, concepts here relate to a different uh, neural pathway. So we know that there's, there's a huge complexity of things happening in the brain as it's learning to read, and they include a lot, all of these different elements simultaneously. Um, we know that we count on, for example, different types of memory systems, declarative knowledge, procedural, conceptual. Um, we also need to have uh, different types of estimation skills, um, symbol interpretations, um, and also um, physical skills, either uh, graphomotor skills or things that have to do with speech. So. All of these different things combine to make reading um, incredibly difficult or incredibly complex in the brain, um, but not nearly as complex as writing. Writing is even one step further. Um, so we know that reading circuits of the brain are, are highly complex, they're, they're, um, they are uh, highly interactive, and if even just one of these pieces isn't you know, working at top speed, we do have um, either delays in reading or we do have actual reading problems that will occur. Um, lots of work here that uh, actually identifies, and all of these are showing, uh, as we said before, the typical brain, you know, this is all left hemisphere uh, imaging here that we're showing, but not necessarily, um, this won't actually be the case for all, all readers. Um, let's see here. Okay, so we also know that the brain um, is reacting differently when it hears high frequency words or low frequency words or words that it's actually used to. So. Um, as, as you've seen in other, um, other things with Dr. Um, Hudson, there, uh, the brain actually works less when it's used to doing something. Once it's learned something, it actually slows down and there's less activity. Um, for example, you'll see here in the middle, um, the brain is kind of going crazy trying to figure out when it reads non-words, when there are words that aren't real words, but the brain is trying to put it together and figure out, well, how come I don't recognize this? Um, so there's a lot more activity going on when it reads non-words. Um, and also um, there's activity going on when there's low frequency words, words that they, uh, the brain isn't used to seeing. But the top picture you'll see where with there's high frequency words, there's less activity happening because basically the brain's more used to what's, uh, what's it's perceiving. We know that um, reading, lexical access, frequency of exposure, all of these things have different impact um, on, on, um, on the way the brain scans look. So if you have the word in your, um, um, in your lexicon, you know, there's going to be less uh, action going on. If you are frequently exposed to the word, then it goes down. Also, the activity goes down with a higher frequency. We know that there's different areas of the brain used for listening as opposed to reading. So these are different, um, different types of scans that will occur. And we also know that just listening to other things um, versus reading, you'll see this um, but it's also right and left hemisphere will also be um, um, lit, lit up, but there's also overlapping pathways. So one of the things that's very important to take away from this is that while we say that there might be these 16 different neural pathways, there are many that are very similar and somewhat overlapping, especially in memory systems, for example. Um, writing is even more difficult than reading. We know that writing um, occupies more brain um, um, real estate than almost anything else. And we don't know for sure which exact areas of the brain are actually executing a lot of the writing. But we do know, for example, in the absence uh, of certain areas of the brain, we know that there is a lack of writing. So we're going to presume that, that area of the brain is very important for writing, but we're not actually sure yet. Um, spelling is different from writing. Spelling is kind of a sub element of being able to write. Um, we actually know that when somebody has a problem, um, for example, on the left-hand side, um, two individuals, there's damage to different regions of the brain. The brain on the left, there's a difficulty in recall between letters and sound. And the person on the right has difficulty in actually spelling, the mechanical spelling of the word. So we know that even though they seem like they might be, they should be the same um, execution in the brain, we see that there are actually different things happening in the brain between spelling and actually writing the brain. We know also that emotionally charged words stimulate other parts of the brain in addition to semantic recall. They also have an um, uh, emotional element to them. So basically, with all of these different pieces in mind, um, there's this question that was posed by uh, Andefri and Goldenberg that was actually, you know, well, so what parts of the brain 
are used in, in, in language and they said, you know, why don't we just say what parts of the brain are not used because that would be easier because almost the entire brain is lit up as you're going through these different language processing, especially in the writing mode. Um, and as we'll see in the, in the second video, um, writing in a foreign language actually uses more parts of your brain simultaneously than almost any other activity that's been documented to date. Um, the last section we're going to look at right now has to do with specific language impairments or what problems can happen or, um, related to language. Um, to do this, um, I'd like to sort of give you a quick introduction through a BBC video. And we're only going to look at the very middle section of this video, um, but to give you a general global idea of the importance of language, and especially as we start to have a look towards um, foreign language. Of taking so much for granted. What are the things that can actually go wrong? So we know that there are certain types of language impairments, uh, things that can be auditory discrimination problems, kid can't distinguish different sounds, receptive uh, problems, expressive uh, problems, um, dyspraxia, phonological programming deficit syndrome, um, lots of things that can come up that would be difficulties for children um, or for adults um, into, their, into their lifespan, which can be either caused by um, you can be born congenital problems, or they can be things that are acquired afterwards. Um, some specific language problems, in order to actually identify them, you know, that they're not a temporary thing, it's basically you have to be interferences. Um, it's a language problem that interferes with daily processes. Um, we've excluded things that could be actual um, sensory um, perception problems, and that they actually have an impact on um, learning in other contexts. These would be sort of characteristics that we'd look for for something that would be labeled a specific language impairment. Um, causes can be a huge variety. Some things can be genetic. We can have um, some other problems that are uh, cognitive defects. You can have other things that were are auditory def um, deficits. There's different routes to these types of problems. Um, some language impairments um, that are not related to, for example, the left hemisphere typically, um, if you do have broken Wernicke's area in your left frontal and parietal lobes, you can still have other types of language impairments caused by difficulties in, in you know, right frontal lobe processing things. For example, loss of prosody and perception, you can't, uh, difficulty in identifying uh, emotions. Um, you can't understand humor or metaphors, so there's a lot of other things that happen in different areas of the brain that are not purely left uh, hemisphere related. Um, we know that there is, and this is a great area for Dr. Peabody, she knows quite a lot about um, traumatic brain injury, uh, especially as it relates to language uh, difficulties. Things can happen with a bump on the head. Um, you saw some things in Dr. Eamon's presentation related to football injuries, but uh, a good bang on the head can actually cause a lot of these different language problems that we're talking about. <clears throat> One um, specific area of language um, deficit that's um, been documented for hundreds of years relates to aphasias. Uh, aphasias are communication disorders. They can have to do with um, expressive um, aphasia, receptive aphasia. They can have to do with production of language, or they can have to do with actually uh, finding or, or identifying um, the right um, words um, to actually produce language. We know that strokes can cause this. Um, you know, a, a blood vessel in the brain that, that can break, that can actually cause uh, language difficulties. Um, so. In general, we associate aphasias with strokes, so they can also be caused by other things uh, like tumors, as we'll see in a minute. Uh, most common aphasias, Broca's aphasia, basically in Broca's area in, in the left frontal lobe, I mean, you can find um, um, this was identified in the first patient that Broca had. We could only say the word tan, 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 tan. Basically, he was unable uh, to produce language, whereas a couple years later, um, Wernicke's aphasia, which is part in the posterior area, found that basically this, people will talk fluidly, but they speak gibberish. It means it, what they're producing actually doesn't make any sense at all. So they'll have a conversation with you, and they'll think that they're speaking perfectly, but what's coming out is a lot of mixed words. There's also recently been identified in an area, Gershman's aphasia is actually the area linking uh, Broca and Wernicke's area that actually has to do with speech production as well. Um, tumors can also cause aphasia. It's not just um, um, strokes that, that are um, that the cause of, uh, of aphasias. And the most common are basically Broca's aphasia, expressive aphasia, and also um, receptive aphasia and, and Wernicke's aphasia.
These are different types of aphasias that have been identified, um, the inability to produce language. And um, now we'll move from aphasias to basically dyslexia. Um, Shamewitz has kind of been like slammed a couple times because of you know this idea of overcoming dyslexia. You can never get rid of dyslexia, right? You can um, you can find some coping mechanisms, however. Um, so what's suggested in her work has to do with a lot of coping mechanisms. We do know that there's differences in the way um, the brains are working. Basically, um, there's an overuse of certain areas of the brain because there's a lack of activation in other areas. There's also presumption that the communication, the natural communication between these areas is blocked. So um, dyslexics can, they do learn to read and write. However, they um, are probably using other systems. Um, we also, there's tons of um, literature out there basically showing how, not in dyslexic cases, but basically in aphasics, that um, there's a far greater use or recruiting of different areas of the brain, basically, um, right hemisphere, basically. Um, and symmetrical areas um, to recuperate language when it's lost. Uh, in terms of uh, dyslexia, that's not the same, the same case, but it's basically trying to find a different way to get the information into the brain because the natural um, pathways are blocked. And so you're having to find a new way to find, uh, to get literacy into your head. We know that um, Plasticity is fabulous. We're not actually sure how what the extent of this is. Um, there's a lot of research going on uh, related to people with just half a brain who can speak just fine, and they, you know, externally you don't see a, a lot of great difference. Um, and even in some cases, for example, they find uh, for this girl, for example, having lost, uh, she was born with with uh, without um, with, without her left left hemisphere, but her language was fine, her reading was fine, which they thought would be impossible, but so we know that other parts of the brain can be recruited for what would be a normal pathway. Uh, we don't know uh, to what extent this occurs. We don't know how frequently it, it can occur. Um, there's tons of studies that are being done to actually try to understand um, why can this person not have, uh, be able to speak clearly, and why can this person without even more of the brain be able to speak clearly? We just don't know that yet. So there's a lot still going on that um, needs to be answered. But um, but it's very important to actually identify that there are very big distinct uh, areas of the brain that are being used. There are no two brains identical in the way that they are connecting language, though there are clear pathways that are typically used for these different elements of language. Um, the last little piece we're going to have here as we transition into the next video about um, bilingualism and multilingualism has to do with uh, bilingual dyslexic. Uh, for example, um, Fascinating cases, in Japanese you have four alphabets, right? You have Romanji, which is the Roman alphabet, it's A, B, C, D, right? Then you have Katakana, which is basically used for things that are foreign words. Hiragana, which is kind of like a script. And you have Kanji, which are more like pictographs. Um, and it's fascinating to find with Japanese aphasics, people who typically should be losing language, they might lose one of these alphabets or another or they might use all of them, but sometimes, generally, if they're going to lose the kanji, they didn't lose the hiragana, katakana, and romanji, and vice versa, which is actually fascinating, but it makes us think that probably that the kanjis might be stored in a different area of the brain because they are related more to um, conceptual imagery as opposed to symbol systems that um, we don't, you know, have a good reason why, you know, A should be A, that, that the physical drawing of that doesn't make a lot of sense to a lot of people. Whereas, you know, if you have, you know, Nihon, which is Ni is the sun, and it looks like the sun coming up in your window, so it's a pictograph, it might be stored, it is stored in a different place in your brain, but we still don't really know that um, for sure. Does the dyslexic brain, we're presuming that there's reduced activity in the posterior area of the brain related to dyslexics, we're not exactly sure why or how, and it's not true in all cases. Um, when you're reading in different languages, we do see that there's different use of different parts of the brain sometimes, depending on whether they're pictographs or not. And for example, in some recent studies on Chinese uh, dyslexics, um, which also use, the Japanese use the similar system of the Chinese, right? We sort of stole that from the Chinese. Um, there are some people who actually say that a uh, dyslexic Chinese brain is different from a dyslexic um, um, Anglo, um, Anglophone brain. It's very curious that the use of the Japanese brains is interesting because they do have both symbol systems as well as the, the pictographs. So still a lot of exciting research going on in that area, but we don't have all positive answers.
Okay, so now we're going to close this section. What did we try to do? We tried to look at the historical uh, or evolutionary perspective of why humans have language in the first place. We looked at some definitions of language and we looked at the developmental processes of language and some key milestones. And we also looked at certain language problems, uh, including dyslexia and, uh, and aphasias. Now we're going to turn to this second video, um, which has to do with multilingualism. And we're going to look at a lot of the myths um, about multilingualism, as well as at least 10 key factors that influence successful multilingualism or bilingualism uh, in school contexts as well as within the home. Thank you very much.